All right. So uh, Flow is a partnership of two people who share a life, their home, and their jewelry studio business. Both Michael Fee and Mary Wolgamuth started their professional careers in the graphic arts. And you can see this influence today in the jewelry they create. A recognizable style of clean lines, thoughtful design, and details of texture and color that delight your eye. Michael has been creating jewelry since the mid 90s, where he began when he began an apprenticeship as a goldsmith. He worked as a solo studio jeweler for 10 years and in 2006 graduated with honors from Northeast Wisconsin Technical College's jewelry fabrication program. A photographer since age 12, Michael also studied fine arts at the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee. Mary's background includes a wide variety of creative pursuits and professional experience, including art direction, illustration, and publishing. Her training in metal arts started at Milwaukee Area Technical College in the 1990s. A graduate of Marquette University, she furthered her fine arts education at the Milwaukee Institute of Art and Design. Mary apprenticed with Michael for full time for three years. Today, Mary and Michael are partners in designing and hand fabricating their jewelry creations. Together, they also design and market tools for jewelry makers with a line of exclusive flagship tools that are made here in Milwaukee. Gemstones are plentiful and flows jewelry line and Mary and Michael source them from all over the world. In addition to metalwork, both partners have lapidary skills and equipment that allow them to cut and form stone slabs into finished shapes called cabochons to use in their jewelry. They create unusual shapes and sizes of extraordinary gemstones you won't find in mainstream jewelry. Both partners enjoy rock hounding, searching for and gathering those one of a kind fossils and artifacts to take back to the studio so they can reveal the beauty within. Michael and Mary show their handcrafted jewelry online and at art fairs throughout the Midwest and are represented in the Milwaukee area at Wauwatosa's Magpie Gallery and also at a new gallery in Arizona. They are, active, they are actively passing the torch to the next generation of metalsmiths, teaching metalwork and stone setting in their hometown by invitation to other metal studios and online. And Mary and Michael, I'm gonna let you take it away from here. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Sarah. So Sarah gave you a really good view of uh, a lot of the different things that we do and we hope to share some, some beautiful images tonight, show you a little bit more about the work and, um, and answer any questions that you might have about what it's like to be a, a working jewelry artist in Milwaukee these days. We have a little slideshow ready to go. Mm -hmm. Could you bring that up? Sure. That I think is a wonderful introduction. You can see the type of work that we do if, you're, if you haven't seen our jewelry before. And get a taste of the, the types of things that we like to do. And we'll tell you a little bit as we go along. So jewelry design behind the torch. Uh, we, we thought we'd use that title just to share with you how we're makers. And uh, we create jewelry, but we're also doing a, a few unusual things that, that some jewelry makers uh, aren't doing beyond the creative. Uh, I wanna share some of our, our jewelry, things that we've done in the past, things that we're working on today. You'll see a, some of that on our model. We also, as Sarah mentioned earlier, we're also kind of passing the torch. Uh, metalwork, jewelry making is such a popular topic, such a popular hobby and also a full-time uh, profession for a lot of people these days. 
so the, now we're also teaching and reaching out, reaching people in new ways that want to learn how to do what we do and want to increase their own skills and, and pursue their own style of jewelry making. The last thing that we'll talk about is tools of the trade, um, how we have expanded beyond our teaching to create some tools that help other makers do what they do, do what they do better, make their job easier. And so we're excited to share some of that with you too. There's a little bonus that uh, Sarah mentioned that a lot of our tools are made right here in Milwaukee. That was important to us. And we thought that was a really cool thing to share with you guys. So I'm gonna click through some of these images. Um, this is actually a, a customer and model of ours that has collected our jewelry for years. And one of her favorite pastimes is poker playing. So we, we took a photo and almost all these images are Michael's beautiful images. Sarah mentioned how he's a photographer and uh, he takes a lot of our portfolio shots. Uh, this was one of them. Kathy, our, our poker shark friend who has collected our jewelry for a long time. So I'll be clicking through these. Some of them I'll, I'll have a little story to tell about. Some I'm just gonna let the jewelry speak. If you're curious about the gemstones, as Sarah mentioned before, you could unmute and uh, go ahead and ask that question, whatever you'd like to know about a, a piece as it comes through or type a message. Sarah will relay that to us if you're curious. But in a lot of cases, I'm letting the jewelry speak. We do both fabricated and cast work. Uh, these happen to be some cast rings. So we're melting silver down, we're pouring it while it's molten liquid and pouring it into a form. But a lot of our work is fabricated from flat sheets of metal and primarily we're working in silver. So we, we have a lot of techniques in our tool bag that we can draw on. Mary, can you tell us a little bit about why you like working with silver? Sure, and Michael can address this too. Uh, the price of gold has just skyrocketed. Um, I do like the quality of silver, even, even if it weren't for the price difference. I love the look of silver and the quality, the ability to uh, add a patina, which you see in these earrings, which means darkening it a little bit, making it look almost like an antique in spots. Um, so silver has a, aside from the, the cost difference, silver has a nice quality all, all by mm -hmm. itself. Michael may, may have a few more things to say on that. He watches the prices of precious metals closely and that's a big factor in our materials cost, of course. Silver has doubled in the last year or so, um, but it's nowhere near as expensive as gold. I used to use a lot more gold maybe 15 years ago, but it's gone so high that we don't, we rarely use it now. It's important to us. We, we want our fans to be able to, to afford our jewelry. We call our jewelry everyday statements. We think of it as uh, jewelry that you can wear when you're out playing out for a night on the town, um, going to work, just about, any daily activities for people who aren't movie stars. So we make everyday jewelry and these are everyday statements that someone would feel comfortable wearing. It's important that, that our people can afford our stuff too. So that's a factor. This is a, a really heavy, shank, which is the, the part of the ring that goes around your finger, a uh, heavy layered shank ring that has a beautiful wave design on it. We've made this ring in a, with a variety of different stones and little different variations each time. We keep coming back to that wave design. We love it. It's a tricky shank to make. This was a special request for a lady who is a big fan of bats and bat conservation. And uh, this was a little bit out of the norm for us to do, but we made a special design just for her and uh, she loved it. 
was a fun challenge. I like it because, um, you know, I don't see the bat uh, right off the yeah. bat, if you will. Yeah. And it's a, a little subtle. And, and then when you say that, I absolutely see the bat. So that's very cool. How, how often do you do customized projects for people? You know, it was something that we really liked to say yes to uh, in the beginning as we were getting started and established. Uh, it's very challenging to, to uh, have a meeting of the minds where that person is communicating what they want and, and the artist has a creative vision and tries to bring it into from nothing into something. Um, and we decided that you know, we try we we did that for a number of years and tried to say yes to a lot of those special projects, and we've kind of phased them out in order to really pursue and focus on our own visions, our own um, creativity, and um, basically not not to have any more disappointments because <laughs> <laughs> sometimes what we see in our mind is different than the person requesting. So. It's, it always adds about three times as much work if you're doing a special request like that. However, I have, all that said, this cuff um, was actually for a delightful lady who, who said pretty much whatever you come up with is gonna be fantastic. So she was, she was not, um, didn't have a lot of parameters for us, which is lovely, which is nice. I wanted to point out, I don't know if I can bring a cursor in to um, show you, but on the lower left of the, the bat cup at the back to the wearer's wrist are two little surprise bats that were part of the design. <clears throat> Tiny little baby bats. And here's a view of us working right here in the studio. Uh, when we finish the sideshow, I'll give you a little panorama of the benches and our stations here. But this is where we work side by side at our benches. Uh, we do a lot of work by hand with small hand tools, just like it's been done for thousands of years and still is all over the world. Um, Michael is using a jeweler's saw there and um, simple hammers, saws, steel bench blocks to, to pound the metal on. Do, the, uh, the left is a printer's, uh, a vintage Hamilton, Wisconsin printer's tray. And that's our treasure trove of cabochons to use in our projects. And Sarah, you had a question, sorry. I was gonna ask you if, um, if maybe both of you want to talk a little bit about how you first met and then began um, working together. Cause I think that's an interesting story. Okay, sure. Uh, Michael, you, you heard Sarah say earlier, Michael had been working as a, a jewelry maker for about 10 years and, and solo artist would, would show his work as a solo artist. And at the time I was an editor for jewelry making how-to books for a local publisher. And so I would go out to local art shows, regional shows and scout for artists to be part of our books or to write a book for us, to propose a book for us. So going to art shows was, was part of my weekend activity for many years. And so we, we met in that way. Then I invited Michael to, to uh, use, to submit some of his beautiful photos to a book that I was compiling. He did that. And um, pretty much from that point on, we've been together ever since. That was mm -hmm. back in, um, 2012 or so. So not super long, but it's been a, a really rewarding and intensive and interesting um, eight, nine years it has. or more. Yeah, nine years. So a little more, another view from one of our workstations. Back to some jewelry. This is a cabochon from the Michigan area. The stone was mined in Michigan. This is a design we call a pod ring. It's 
the form that you see here with all the dots are actually holes. This back of the pot is hollow, which gives it a really interesting um, shape and sound and everything. Thinking of it like a seed pod. This is another stone we cut. Uh, the stone originally came from Turkey. So back to when we mentioned we source our stones from all over the world, it is pretty easy these days to connect with um, the stone cutters, the miners, people who are finding these really interesting, the really interesting material everywhere, um, connecting through social media. What kind of stone is it? Is it chalcedony? I believe it's a chalcedony. The type of stone is called a druzy. It, what you see are little sparkles, little um, quartz crystals at the top of it, which gave this piece just, just beautiful sparkling um, top. It's kind of irregular also. It's not a smooth top stone like you'd see in, in many of the cabochons, which is the name for the smooth top stones that we often use. Um, so it had a really interesting surface. And yeah, whenever it's very you, beautiful. A lot of times when you see us using um, this, what is for us drill holes, when we drill through the silver and do a pattern like this, we're, we're usually evoking the night sky. This piece um, I know did have a, a moonlight theme the smaller stones are actually called moonstones, rainbow moonstones. So celestial so themes you'll see a lot of as we go along here. Another design that's hollow, very lightweight, interesting um, shape and dimension. The background of this sheet of silver has a, a really interesting process called reticulation that creates that very heavy texture, kind of like the moon's surface, ripples of texture. Um, that's something that, that we like to use a lot of in our work. This is a beautiful Boulder opal from Australia. Mined only there, I, I believe. Yes. The only place you can find this gorgeous stone. Uh, the backgrounds are usually caramel brown, like you see, and then a boulder opal will have ribbons of opal in all, all amazing patterns. Can you talk a little bit about how you choose the stones for your pieces? Well, it's it depends on, on how we're approaching the design. Um, because we have the ability to cut our own stones, we can sort of design from scratch and then cut the stone to fit uh, the, the piece, which is what we did with this ring that you just, which was, which was just up on the screen. Uh, we also buy finished cabochons from uh, sellers all over the world. And in, the, in those cases, we will choose the stone and then work the design around it. And some, so sometimes it's, it's just straight eye appeal of, of a gorgeous stone that suggests something to us and from the start. And you know, you want to showcase it. Sometimes I like to put the real beauties into a ring um, so that the wearer can also enjoy. If you put a, a gorgeous stone into a pendant, the, the wearer doesn't always get to enjoy that pendant, but in a ring, she or he can see it too. So I, I consider that sometimes too. We do have a question, um, okay, Michelle. Good. Michelle asks, um, she says, in the pre-made bezels that you sell, it looks like the seat is already well cut and doesn't need much shaping. And she's just asking if that's, if that's right. 
Yes. Sounds, sounds like she's asking about our tube settings. Yes. Yes. I would assume so. Yes. They are pre cut and ready to go. Um, occasionally, the stone may be slightly too large, and you may need to take a burr to it and enlarge it slightly, but yes, they're ready to go. And we can help her um, directly, too, if she wants to send us a message about that. Glad to help her. This shows a couple of those trays, the printer tray that I mentioned earlier, the cabinet of curiosities, all full of stones that we've collected. I think we have enough stones to last, last a lifetime, but we're still buying. <laughs> we're still collecting. Mary loves her stones. A lot of earring pairs in the lower left, so they actually cut mirror image pairs of stones when they and sell them as cabochons to make earrings with. Some slabs of turquoise in the upper left. That's some beautiful, really old turquoise that we, we will shape ourselves. It looks like you have things very organized. Do you have a, a certain system? I organize by color and maybe a little bit by type, like I keep all the, the earring pairs together. It helps me focus. Uh, but I tend to organize by color, maybe a little bit by shape. Mm -hmm. Very well, we organized. Have, what was that? Very organized. Yes. Uh, we have another question. Uh, Samantha um, asks, what is your favorite stone to work with? Oh my. I'll let you answer that. I don't have a favorite. I, it, it would be too hard to pick. I'd have to agree. It, it's kind of like the, the next thing that I see that I get excited about is, is my next favorite and it changes all the time. Um, so, so it's important to keep making and using up all the, the stash that we have, these stores of treasures so that we can go on to that next, next best thing that we see. I have a lot of favorites. I'm, I'm pretty, I'm pretty open on that. This is a, an almost transparent stone called Montana agate. And a lot of this we get from our local gem shop up in Cedarburg. That's where this one came from. We, we don't have a lot of stores like that around here where you can go and just enjoy looking at different types of rocks and minerals and learn from a guy who's been mining for decades, but Cedarburg has it and, and it's called the gem shop if you ever wanna visit. The purple stone is amethyst. Here's a design where you see lots of layers of texture, textured metal. And then Michael does some hand engraving. That's how the marks on the ring band were made with engraving tools. The marks on the ring itself were made with different uh, stamps and small tools. The ring that you just saw in these earrings are, have a stone called kyanite, beautiful blue, kind of a denim blue color. Another cuff that shows that gorgeous reticulated texture that I talked about early that we create with, it's done, it, with heating and cooling, heating and cooling, a lot of rounds at the torch, uh, firing up the torch, treating the metal, cooling it down. And it creates this really interesting surface where you're actually melting some of the metal and other parts of the metal are cool. And so it, it gives you these rivulets of texture that are very interesting. Another design that has our, our signature pattern of drill holes. 
this cuff be named for the first one that we did that I showed you earlier in a bright blue is called Earthrise Cuff. It reminds us of um, that famous moon shot, the first time the astronauts saw the Earth from space. We'll show you that again. I have another picture of the Earthrise Cuff coming up. A ring with a simu similar texture. Michael and Mary, if um, somebody wants to get started and hasn't really done anything like this before, do you, how do, what do you uh, recommend that they, how do they begin? Do they take like a class making something specific or how would you suggest they get started? We will talk a little bit more about our own teaching schedule in, a, in just a, a minute or so. We like to teach skills through projects. In other words, we have a, a whole range of projects ranging from beginner to advanced, intermediate, advanced. And we will kind of gauge what the, the student wants to learn. If, if she or he is interested in a certain technique, um, we usually have a project in our repertoire that teaches that technique and we'll you know, gauging the skill level and what where that person wants to start. Well, we have projects that are designed to teach that. So we have somebody coming in for some private lessons, in fact, and she's bringing her daughter and had a, a little list of things that they wanted to learn. And we have a project to fit. So uh, that's how we approach it. We like the person to have the I guess the fulfillment of being able to leave with a project that they can wear, as well as those skills that they wanted to start learning. So I hope that answers the question. Yeah, it does. Um, we do have another question from um, somebody in the audience um, asking if you'll, you'll be um, working with a torch tonight or doing any um, kind of demonstration. You know, what we could do as we do a quick scope around the studio, if the torches are turned on, we can just light up, fire up a torch. They can just see the size of the torch and the flame that we typically use. That might be interesting. Glad to do that, sure. You know, I'll mention, uh, we'll talk more about teaching shortly again, but um, of course, until the, the COVID pandemic hit, we were teaching a nice range of classes locally. Um, and that really changed our world a lot and changed the world for everybody and especially teachers. So that would address that person's question too, as far as um, learning skills when the world opens back up, when Milwaukee opens back up and things are, are when everyone is comfortable teaching and learning in small settings again, there may be the opportunity for classes in person again too. So that has changed over the past years. We'll, we'll talk a little bit about that. These are just some of this is a nice photo of some of the tools that we typically use. These are tiny little, uh, about a, a quarter inch and smaller, tiny little burrs are what they're called that we use in stone setting. We'll show you this live in a little bit. That's our torch, one of our torches. We have several. Some more hand tools. A lot of this work is, is done with by hand and eye. So um, hand tools are important. Good hand strength is important. Good hand-eye coordination is important. And we do have a comment. Um, you guys are great. Love the original designs. Oh, thank, oh, thank you. you. <clears throat> so
So we're coming close to the end of our portfolio of jewelry images. I want to be sure that we have enough time to answer more questions and have a little Q&A at the end. If I'm going too fast for anyone, let me know. This is a, a cuff, a cuff bracelet, and it's a little bit different with all the graphic patterning on it. I wanted to show you a little bit of, of what went into the making of this, especially for people out there who love to doodle and draw and uh, design. This, we put together a little bit differently where we first drew a design. I had two little uh, patterns in there that are placeholders for the gemstones. Finished up the design, a lot of drawing and doodling. And then this pattern was etched onto a plate. So just a little different way of making jewelry where this was rolled through a a very heavy steel press and impress the design on the silver. Another technique in our bag of tricks. This is a, a stone called Wisconsin Jade. Do you remember the formal name for it? I do not. <clears throat> Wisconsin Stone. We found at a gem and mineral uh, show in the area. We like to use local stones when we can too. This was the, the Earthrise version of the cuff, the very first one that we did where it got its name. This went on to be a teaching project for us that we've taught in workshops many times. Just to give you an idea of how we get that dark color that is silver that starts out light and bright. And what we're doing is painting on an oxidizing solution that accelerates the effects of oxidation on silver, just like if you left a a piece out in the atmosphere, out in your, um, on your dresser for a long time, eventually silver takes on a, a black tone from impurities in the air. We'd like to accelerate that when there's texture on the piece. So we have some solutions that we can paint right on and then brush back to reveal some highlights of the silver. How long would a project like that take um, during a, a workshop? That's two full days of work, working six, seven hours with students. Yeah, it's, and that's cutting it close. <laughs> Pretty intensive. This is a project called Rising Moon. And I, I like to share this one because it was one of our first collaborations between um, Michael and me to create a design and then go on to build a teaching project from it. So this was one of the first classes that we taught together and it, it teaches a variety of techniques and we still teach it today, in fact. And so that, that brings us to the, the second part, the, our teaching and reaching out to others in the community and how we are passing the torch to the, the newest generation of metalsmiths out there. Um, sometimes we're teaching in our home studio, we teach private lessons. <clears throat> we have just started to teach via Zoom as well. And this opens up uh, a wide world to us where we can teach people anywhere in the world. We have a lot of followers on social media and it's just wonderful to be able to reach out to them now just with this tool that we're using tonight. It's incredible. Um, this, 
this gives you an example of the, the Northern Knights ring that you saw earlier. Here's another version of it. And this was another project that uh, is a favorite of our customers. And we decided to turn it into a teaching project. And we develop a handout for our students that you can see in the background where they have something to follow around along and uh, learn the step-by-step -step making of the project. That's another part of our workshops. There's one of our happy students just made her own Northern Knights ring. Sometimes we teach at big venues, big shows. Milwaukee had the huge beat and button show for many years. Michael and I taught together there close inspection of, of her Earthrise cuff, checking it with some magnifiers. That's what Michael's wearing on his head there too. Those are called optivizers where when he pulls those down over his glasses, they give him super vision to look closely. I can't work without it. And then that brings us to the third part that we plan to talk about tonight, which is the tools of our tools of the trade. Our teaching classes for so many years showed us that students were interested in, in some of the tools that we, we were using to create our projects. They were building their own studios at home, adding to their toolbox. And we saw an opportunity to create some sets of tools that were well-made, very well-made, and also had just the right amount of uh, right sizes, right amount, right set of tools for the job that we didn't see in the marketplace. So Michael and I talked for a while and brainstormed of what we could do. And we ended up finding manufacturers right here in the Milwaukee area that could make this vision happen for us and create this tool set. This is one of them. This is a set of tools that helps you set stones, small stones. And uh, we started with the idea of we would just make them for our students and use them in classes, but this has grown beyond our dreams into something that we sell worldwide. I, I just uh, saw an order that's going out to New Zealand for one of these sets. Um, and we've been able to reach out to people, it's via social media. So it was really a nice combination of the idea to create these tools, the just boom in the number of people who are working metals, creating jewelry at home in home studios, and three, the, the ability to reach out via social media, which didn't exist for us 10 years ago or so. So it's, it's been a wonderful way to give people tools that help them do their work easier. And this is a bench pin. It's a tool that's front and center at the jeweler's bench. We do a lot of filing and sawing and different work. You'll see that in the next slide at this tool. And this is our design and again, now this Bench pin is manufactured for us right here in Milwaukee. And we ship, ship it out around the world. It has a few nice little design features. You see Michael cutting some tubing on the ledge of it. And this is a, a tool that's been in existence for hundreds, if not thousands of years. Usually it's made out of wood we had the idea to, to make it out of material like you'd see in your just your kitchen store cutting board material and it's been wonderful people love it this is another of our, our tools it's something that we use every day to set bigger stones with cabochons it's called a bezel pusher we have a variety of sizes for different ways of working been very popular. 
And, and what we can do on social media too is also, this is something that people find uh, is really easy on their stones. They don't break stones. They don't scratch stones. They don't scratch their metal. We can also teach them how to use the tools. So we do shorter little lessons on Instagram and social media and showing them how we use the tools and giving them ideas. And sometimes they show us how uh, the, the ideas they have, how to use our tools, which is great. For those of you familiar with Etsy, that's the platform that we use where we sell a lot of our tools and supplies these days. This is our storefront. We'll give you some links if anyone's interested in visiting later. Flow Studio Supply is the name of that shop. And Flow Studio Jewelry is, is our design, our jewelry design side. So this gives you some links to us, our website. You can always call me. That's my phone number. You'll reach me. Happy to talk to you guys. Um, it gives you our two Instagram accounts. And we now actually have two Facebook accounts as well for the jewelry and um, our tools if you're interested. And then we'll, we'll give you that little look around our studio now. We just wanted to, we can show you live. Maybe take a little look at our torch station for the people who wanted to see us. Uh... Mary, I'm just gonna um, have you pause for just a moment. If okay. people want to be able to see it um, better, if you click on the view and then you'll see speaker view as an option, that's how you can see the studio a little bit bigger instead of seeing everybody. So that's just an option out there if you wanna do that. It's speaker view in the view section. Good point. So in the background, that's our soldering station. Michael's going to light up. We have a, that little buzzing sound is a torch igniter. We have an automatic lighter for our torch. We have a big torch for big jobs. That's what he just got going. And we have a small torch for more delicate work, earrings and earrings posts. So we make our choice of, of what, how big the flame needs to be before we decide which one to light up and use. And then we'll show you around a little bit more. Way in the background is some of our stone cutting equipment. And I'll swing you around behind Michael is a view of his bench with all those hand tools that we talked about, you saw earlier. And then my workspace, my bench is side by side with his. And that's our studio. So we really appreciate you guys checking out our work and enjoying our slideshow. And we're happy to, to try to help with questions, anything that we might have left out or you'd like to know, feel free to ask. And you're welcome to share your video or unmute yourself if you would like to just ask a question or we can, um... Uh, I can see the chat box, um, so you can type it in the chat box as well. And Valerie says, thank you for the presentation. She enjoyed it. You're welcome. Thank you, Valerie. 
we appreciate that everybody took the time tonight. I know sometimes you can sign up for a, a meeting like this or a presentation and then the, the evening comes and there, there's a lot of other things that are pressing on your time. So it, it, we're really grateful that you took some time with us in the library. Do you have any online classes coming up? We do, and the best way to, to find out about that is to follow us on Instagram. And the account handle, Flow Studio Supply, is where we tend to share all the tips and techniques and class info. So that would be a good place to follow us, and you'll always know about a class coming up on Zoom there. Uh, another good place for that would be to follow us on Facebook as well. But these days, if you're into Instagram, that tends to be the first place that we post. And um, also we're looking for, we were looking for info on what our Instagram followers wanted to learn. So we reached out via Instagram and asked them of the projects that they had seen, what would they like to learn most? So that's another place where if you're interested in classes, you can actually give us input too and tell us uh, what you'd like to, which project you'd like to see turned into a, a lesson, tutorial, even though we already have quite a few to offer, but we're always open to hear what people wanna learn, so. Thank you, that question was from Stephanie. Uh, Michelle says, thank you, very nice pre presentation. Uh -huh. um, Sam says, wonderful presentation. Hi to Emmy and Angelica. I think that's some people uh, who are here as well. Um, Hello, Lucinis. Oh, actually, we know Emmy is your doggy, right? Yeah. <laughs> and um, let's see, we had another comment um, from Samantha. You make amazing jewelry. Thank you so much for sharing. Oh, you're, welcome. you're welcome. Thank you, Samantha. We also want to share some little let, mini lessons, let's call them, via Instagram, where we would, and Zoom, I should say, uh, where we're inviting people to a free Zoom presentation similar to this, similar format to this, and demonstrate, again, as I said before, how to work with our, our tool set, how to use um, the bezel pushers, different pick little different techniques and show what how we use them on Zoom so people could tune in and get a mini lesson for free from us, you know, no no payment required. So we'll be doing some of that too. And the, the place to follow that would be Instagram too to learn about that. And um, Stephanie says looking forward to seeing you in the future. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thanks, Stephanie. Michael, I was wondering, um, uh, Mary apprenticed with you for three years. Mm -hmm. Have you, had you um, apprenticed anyone else before or had anyone else apprenticed with you? No, just Mary. Okay. Mary was my first. He, and had, a, he had a helper right before me. He had a, a young man that was helping at his studio for a while, but didn't really go through like the, no. in all the ins and outs of learning all the different techniques that you need to learn. Right. He didn't really have the aptitude. <laughs> yeah, so if you're an apprentice, I guess you're also, you're learning, but then you're also kind of doing a tryout uh, so that the master tells you, uh, do you have the skills? Do you have the ability to, to do this? Are you picking up the different techniques quickly enough? And what do you look for if someone uh, like to evaluate whether they have the aptitude when you evaluated that person? Just their ability to, to produce nearly perfect work. <laughs> <laughs> Michael has high standards. <laughs> so he's a good teacher. High standards, we like, and then, I have uh, adopted that 
view too that we kind of set the bar when we teach and we like to teach best practices. Here's, here's the way we do it. There always are many, many ways to achieve the results, but here's the way we do it. That's usually what people are, are here to learn. And um, we're gonna teach you best practices for doing this. Um, then you, you take it into your own studio and you can do with it what you want, but that's something that's important for us to share that, that here's, here are some of the best ways to achieve certain results. Yes. And you'll get fantastic looking results. <laughs> You mentioned that COVID changed things. I mean, it's changed so many things. Um, so now you're experimenting and actually teaching online um, yep. via Zoom. How else ha has it impacted you, do you think, in terms of your jewelry making? Yeah, the, probably the first thing that we felt was the art shows that we use, that used to fill our spring and summer closed. Um, so we have to apply to these shows very far in advance. They're typically juried shows, which means they evaluate your work and decide whether they want you in their show or not. Um, so you pay an entry fee, they evaluate your work, and then they let you know, yep, you made it or no, not this year. So that was the first thing that we felt where we uh, probably had applied to quite a few things back in January and February, um, but by March, as as things immediately came to a halt, shows were canceled um, from spring through summer into fall, which is our, our big show season. We would usually pack up and take our jewelry around to different shows almost every other weekend in, around the Midwest. So that was uh, it was kind of a double-edged sword, a blessing, but also a real change in the way we work. A blessing because we had a lot of time at the home studio to really focus on work and new directions for our business, including the, some of the things that you saw, teaching, developing more classes, and um, the, the tools and supplies and how we could serve the metalwork community better with those products. So it kind of gave us the time to sit and reflect on that and, and expand those aspects of our business to kind of change it and enlarge it where it was really focused on jewelry making before. So, and now things are opening up again. We're seeing, we have about three or four shows in the Milwaukee area already that we know will be on. Um, we're active in the Wisconsin Designer Crafts Council, uh, local statewide organization of artists, fine crafts people in all media, and um, a big show that they put on in the summer is Morning Glory. Maybe some of you know that. So in August, we'll be part of Morning Glory. There's a fun a fall craft tour also sponsored by this group. WDCC is the abbreviation. Milwaukee Fine Crafts Tour, did yes, I get that right? That's right. In the fall, um, that's a, a really fun tour of artist studios where four or five artists get together at a host studio. And so you'll get to see how that host artist, how they work, you can tour their studio and we'll be a guest at someone else's studio for that. So slowly the, the shows are coming back and they're figuring out a way to do it safely and take that, take that leap. <clears throat> it's hard when a show closes for a year or so uh, to come back and uh, reach its audience. And so we'll hope people are ready, are excited to get out there and browse and shop and enjoy a day of art show again. Can you tell us about the Arizona connection? You, you mentioned a new gallery that um, represents you. Is it a connection with the gem show or something else? Well, that that's an interesting story. That uh, came about because I, well, I'm a, a big jewelry fan myself. I um, support other artists, other jewelry makers, other um, 
artists in different disciplines. I love to collect um, jewelry and just beautiful examples of work, whether it's vintage, whether it's contemporary, and an artist that I admire very much. And I've collected her work. Um, we reconnected after about 10 years. I had collected a beautiful piece from her and we reconnected. I reached out to her. Um, her daughter is also a, a, a carver and jewelry maker. Um, and when we kind of found out what each of us were doing at this point in our lives, she invited us to send some work to her new gallery. So up, up till now, she really had been just like us, just making and, and showing through other galleries. And now in her retirement has decided to open a gallery and show her work along with other artists. And she said she would like our work there. And I, I was honored and pleased. And Tubac is a, is a beautiful, almost a border town between Arizona and Mexico, um, very, filled with art, filled with galleries, um, wonderful place. So that's where her gallery is. If anyone is, is interested in the name of this artist, her name is Patty Fawn and she is a Native American artist. I, I, since you asked about that, I have to show off um, an image of her that I, that really inspires me. It's at my bench. You might have seen it before, but if you see that black and white photo that's in the background, are you able to see it? It's a little yes. tiny. Um, that's Patty in, in her young days, probably in her late 20s or so. Um, historical photo that I found and was the, the impetus for me to reach out to her and reconnect after all these years. I sent her a copy of that photo and just told her how much she inspires me <laughs> so that's so nice i i was a, curious a about reconnection photo. what was that I, I was just saying that's so nice i was curious about the photo but i thought well i'm not going to ask about that because it's about your jewelry but i didn't know there was a connection there so. yeah she's an inspiration she's in a wonderful lady so we we also had a question about morning glory um do you know when when it's going to be this year August, around August 10th. Around August 10th, okay. And they have a Facebook page. They're, they're very active. There's a new show director and uh, they're doing great things. So you'd find them on Facebook uh, to learn all the details. I'm sure they'll be profiling the artists and telling you more details as it comes closer. That's great. And yes, I see the question, they are back. So we're excited for that too. Glad to see that come back. Is there another show that comes to mind? We're in a, a show in the third ward in mm -hmm. fall too. That's been a favorite of ours and a favorite for a lot of people. Yeah, very nice show. September. So little by little, the shows are coming back. Yeah, and there a lot of them are outdoors, right? Yes. Um, so that's kind of something that we can do now. Um, you know, exactly. even with, with things. Um, I just saw the CDC said that, um, you know, if you're in crowds, they recommend a mask, but if you are outdoors in uh, a smaller gathering, um, a mask isn't necessary. So um, if, um, if we don't have any other questions though, I think we could um, call it a night and I just, really thank you guys both so much for sharing your work. It's so beautiful. And I like hearing the stories about you working together. And um, thank you so much for taking the time tonight um, to talk to us about your work. You're welcome. You're welcome, Sarah. We appreciate the invitation and we appreciate all these people that spent their, spent an hour with us tonight. And thank you to everybody who, um, came with us tonight and asked questions. And um, again, we will be posting the recording if you wanna come back to it um, and you can feel free um, to check it out uh, for contact info for uh, Michael and Mary too. Thanks everyone. Right. Thank you. Thank you.